Hello, life science. We've finished with plants, which means we only have one major kingdom left after bacteria and protists and fungi and plants will come animals. That would be the kingdom to which we belong. And if we're going to talk about animals, we need to start at the most basic, and that would be invertebrates, animals that lack a backbone. If we're going to talk about animals, we need to talk about body shapes and the uh, best, most basic way to talk about body shapes is to talk about body symmetry. And there are three kinds. The first kind is spherical symmetry. Spherical symmetry is when a body can be cut into identical halves by any cut through the center. So uh, just take like a ball or something. No matter how you turn or rotate that ball, if you cut through the center, you'll have two identical hemispheres. Okay, um, so how about another kind, radial symmetry. Radial symmetry is more of a tube shape. It's where you can be cut into two identical halves by any longitudinal cut through the center. Um, longitudinal cut means like lengthwise. Um, if you've, you know, been doing arts and crafts in school, sometimes you'll talk about cutting in half hamburger or hot dog. Well, this would be hot dog. This is lengthwise. So like a tube or a cylinder, if you cut down the length of it, you'll have two identical halves, two, you know, half pipes. The last kind of symmetry is called bilateral symmetry. This is the kind of symmetry that we have. This is where you can be cut into two identical halves by a single longitudinal cut through its center. So if you have a left and a right half, you have bilateral symmetry. Tubes don't have a left and a right half because you can rotate it any way you like and it's still the same shape. And spherical um, symmetry doesn't have a left or right half because every half is equal no matter how you cut it. Anyway, that is bilateral symmetry, radial symmetry, and spherical symmetry. So now that we've talked about the basic shapes of animals, let's actually talk about some animals. The first phylum we're gonna talk about is phylum periphera. This is the sponges. Sponges doesn't sound like it should be an animal, but it is. Um, I kid you not, when I um, told my daughter, who was five at the time, my daughter loves animals, that um, sponges were animals, she got really mad at me. Uh, she got so mad that she hit me in the face. Don't worry, I was fine. She was five. But um, it just goes to show how outrageous and unexpected um, it is that a sponge could be an animal, uh, even for a kindergartner. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about these sponges. So first of all, they live in mostly marine environments and they are often mistaken for plants. Uh, it's easy to see how you might mistake them for plants. They look like they're rooted in the ground. Um, they don't move around. They have these you know, kind of like branching structures. So they're kind of plant-like in appearance. However, they are not plant-like in their physiology whatsoever. Everything that we just learned about plants doesn't apply to sponges at all. The, uh, the resemblance is very superficial. Um, now, these two pictures, the one that um, looks like it might wear square pants, uh, that is probably a synthetic sponge. That one is probably made out of some kind of foam and is not actually organic. The one on the right though, that's what an actual sponge would look like. Now, it has um, great usefulness as a uh, scrubbing cleaner, which is why we've you know adopted it and copied it, but um, that's, not what we mean when we say sponge, that, you know, perfect cube-shaped thing. It's the weird lumpy thing on the right. Just make sure that we have that clear. But obviously you can see the similarities. There's lots of holes in both of them. If you were to feel them, they both feel kind of rough. Anyway, let's talk about um, what shape their bodies have. Since we were talking about shape, they don't actually have a symmetrical shape. They come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. So for example, we've got a uh, flat, tubular, branched, cup-like, vase-like. They could be as small as your fingernail or they could be large enough for you to sit in it. That's right, a lot of varieties in phylum periphera, the sponges. So we got their body shape. Let's talk about their body structure. Their bodies have two layers of cells. First, an epidermis. Uh, epidermis always just refers to the outermost layer of cells. But 
beneath the epidermis, they have what is called a mesenchyme. And a mesenchyme for a sponge is like this jelly-like substance that separates the epidermis from the inner cells in a sponge. So two layers of cells, one of them is the epidermis, and between those two layers there is this spongy stuff called mesenchyme. Okay, the mesenchyme are not cells, it's this layer of spongy stuff between the layers. Let's move on. So um, the structure of its body, it keeps its shape um, with a network of these hard structures called spicules. They're found mostly in the mesenchyme. Mesenchyme. And um, they are made of calcium carbonate or silica. Those are two minerals. Um, calcium carbonate is very common in seashells, so it's, it's widely available in the ocean. And silica is um, one of the most common ingredients in dirt. So it's just, just plain old minerals from the earth. And uh, sometimes these spicules that are in the mesenchyme will extend through the epidermis, you know, and uh, that can actually make the sponge kind of spiny. So, uh, you know, it's going to feel kind of prickly if you try to try to hold it. Okay, so that's the harder part of its body structure. There is a slightly softer part. It is a tough web of protein. It's called spongin, which is about the best name for sponge protein that I could possibly think of. And this feels soft. Um, so it's, you know, kind of flexible, not sharp and hard like um, the spicules. And it's useful as a soft absorbent tool for cleaning and other uses. So if you were to have a natural sponge, you know, for cleaning, it would be made out of spongin. So how do sponges eat? They don't have like a mouth. They have canals and cavities all throughout its body. I mean, if you've ever seen a sponge, you know it's full of little holes. So there's a whole bunch of paths through the sponge's body. These are lined with collar cells that are called choanocytes. And these all have flagella. Remember flagella from uh, bacteria and uh, from proteists? Um, that's like that whip-like tail structure that some cells have. And they push water through a sponge. You can almost think of it like, like they're paddling, like they're sweeping water through the sponge, and they're beating constantly, which causes a constant stream, current of water through the sponge's body. So things that are getting caught up in this current, like algae, bacteria, organic debris in the water, they're extracted, absorbed, and then digested by the sponge. So if you have a fish tank, it's got like a, a filter on it. So it's constantly pumping up water, putting it through a filter, and then dumping it back out. That's kind of what sponges are doing. Their choanocytes, their flagellated um, collar cells, are sweeping water through the canals and cavities in its body, and it's absorbing nutrients as they pass. By the way, I just want it to be abundantly clear that I just went like this, like... It was my job to go like that. Anyway, moving on. So uh, here's a, a nice diagram uh, for you um, that should kind of make uh, kind of make the appearance make some bit of sense. We're looking at different cross sections of a sponge's body, and um, all the different ways that the uh, canals and cavities can uh, manifest in their body. And the the blue arrow refers to uh, represents a current of water passing through it. Okay, so let's talk about amoebocytes for a second. These are cells that move using pseudopods. Um, so if you remember amoeba from uh, the protist uh, unit, amoeba were sarcodines, which means that they move with pseudopods. Um, so these cells also move like amoeba do, and they perform different functions in different animals. So these would be present in a wide variety of animals, but in sponges, they are specialized for digestion because Sponges don't have digestive organs. An organ is just a collection of tissues that all work together for a common purpose, and tissues are just specialized cells that are all working together. Well, if you have a very, very simple body with few kinds of specialized cells, rather than having a 
bunch of them all working together in tissues to form organs, you can actually just have individual cells performing that task. Now, do you have an army of cells not connected to each other that are free flowing that perform a task for you? You do. They're your blood cells. Blood cells don't move with uh, pseudopods. Blood cells um, are just carried along by the stream of your blood. But the point is, you can have cells that are specialized to perform a task that are not connected to you. Um, they might even be able to move. Your immune system has the ability to move autonomously. So this might seem strange to you, but only if you forget how your own body works. This is, um, I don't want to say typical because this is so amazing, but um, this is something that you'll find in nature. So there are some other tasks that they do. For example, they transport digested food. They transport waste products. They exchange gases. By the way, those are all things that your blood does. These are necessary bodily functions for any animal to digest food, to get rid of waste, to exchange gases. All that we're going to be learning for the rest of the year is how different kinds of creatures do these necessary tasks. They're all essential services, so to speak. Okay, and the last thing that they're specialized for is to produce the calcium carbonate, or lime is another name for that, for spicules. All right, so um, when a sponge is reproducing, it's got a couple different ways that it can do that. One way that it can do is with asexual budding. That's where um, a sponge can basically grow out of um, a pre-existing sponge. And that's related to the next point, which is they can regenerate missing body tissue. So let's say like a piece of a sponge breaks off. Well, that broken piece can become its own sponge. And the sponge that had a piece broken off can, you know, grow to heal and replace what broke off. So that's another way to get two sponges when you used to have just one. During a period of freezing temperatures, they can produce what is called a gemule. This is a cluster of cells that is encased in a hard, spicule-reinforced shell. It might kind of remind you of endospores from the bacteria unit. Now, sometimes collar cells, those would be the choanocytes that lie in the cavities and canals in the sponge's body, can produce gametes. Gametes are haploid, which means they only have half of their parents' DNA. And the purpose of a gamete, like a sperm or an egg, is to combine with another gamete so that half and half make a whole, half and half of DNA, that is, to make a whole genome. So that would be a form of sexual reproduction. Okay, so we're through with sponges. Uh, I think we've soaked up everything we can about those. So now we're going to drift over to phylum cnidaria. Now, this would be jellyfish. They have radial symmetry. So we went from phylum periphera, which had no symmetry, to phylum cnidaria, which has radial symmetry. Their body consists of tentacles, a mouth, and a sac-like gut. So they catch prey with their tentacles by releasing something called a nematocyst. These are small capsules that contain a toxin which is injected into prey or predators, depending on whether it's attacking or defending. So this is what you are getting when you get stung by a jellyfish. Uh, rather than like an injection like a bee gives you, this is um, more like a... Uh, <laughs> more like a little capsule. I, I, don't, I don't know what... Uh, what metaphor would necessarily be appropriate, but it's like um, a small little, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just trying to avoid being, being violent. So um, I'm just gonna describe it technically without the metaphors. Let's move on. It's a small capsule and it's called a nematocyst. Um, so uh, this is something that is kept in the tentacles so that um, when a creature disturbs them, it receives that, uh, uh, that nematocyst. Okay, so there's two body forms. One is called a polyp. That is a sessile, which means it's attached to a surface. Tubular, so it has that, you know, radial symmetry. 
form of an Adarian with a mouth and tentacles at one end, okay, so mouth, tentacles, and a basal disc on the other. That would be, you know, like a little coaster that it's sitting on. Sure, that sounds good. Um, the other body form is called a Medusa. Um, Medusa, you may know from uh, from mythology. It was like, you know, the, the Gorg, um, Gorgon? Was she a Gorgon? I think she was. And um, she had the snakes for hair. So it's referring to the shape, you know, that's all the tentacles coming off of it. And a Medusa is a free-swimming Nidarian, so it's not sessile, it's not planted, you know, with a bell-shaped body and tentacles. So a polyp and a Medusa. So um, as far as their body structure goes, um, it is uh, kind of similar to... Um, the uh, periphera, if you remember, um, where uh, you, per, yeah, periphera, where it had um, two layers of cells that were separated by a mesenchyme. Again, the um, nadarian has two layers of epithelial cells, but they are not separated by a mesenchyme. Um, by the way, an epithelium, um, that refers to animal tissue that consists of one or more layers of cells that only have one free surface. So if you can think of like a sticker, right? You put a sticker on a surface. One side of the sticker is exposed. It's a free surface, but the other side of the sticker is not free. It's stuck to something, right? So um, if you have something called epithelial, um, that just means that one side is exposed. All right. So the other surface is adhering to a membrane or some other surface. The epithelium contains nerve cells. And this means that it's able to sense outside stimuli and then coordinate the organism's response to it. Remember, one of the um, requirements, uh, the criteria for life is the ability to respond to stimuli in your environment. Well, this is how a jellyfish or a nidarian will do that. Um, the epithelium also contains contractile cells. Uh, those are cells that can change their shape, and they allow the organism's body to bend and produce movement. So that is the body structure of phylum nidaria. Um, by the way, you have epithelial cells too. Did you realize that? Um, inside your mouth, like, you know, if you were to... I don't want to reach in my mouth during the video. It'd be kind of weird... Ugh. Anyway, um, if you were to like reach on the inside of your cheek, so those are cells in there. They're not like dead, like on the outside of your cheek. These, this epidermis is like dead skin. On the inside of your cheek, those are living cells. And so the part that you can touch, those are epithelial cells. Oh, sorry, I just uh, went too far. All right, so uh, body structure of uh, nadarians. Um, they have uh, no respiratory or excretory system. They have no way to breathe. They have no way to, uh, how to make excretory system school, for, eh, they have no way to poo. Anyway, um, what that means is when it comes to gases in and out or waste out, it doesn't need a system to deal with that exchange. It's just able to freely dissolve into its environment. Okay. Um, the nadarian has no amoebocytes. Remember, those are those free specialized cells that performed tasks in sponges. And uh, they also have thin epithelial layers that permit a direct exchange with its environment. All right, so um, we can uh, move on now uh, to a hydra, also part of phylum nadaria. So it has tentacles around its mouth. So that's nice. Um, uh, they also have nematocysts. Remember, those are those capsules of toxins in the tentacles of a uh, jellyfish. They are in the tentacles of a hydra. They lie within special structures that contain a pressure-sensitive trigger. Um, what this means is it will release those nematocysts, but not like as a conscious choice. It is a, um, it's a reflex, okay? Uh, we talked about reflexes with plants when we were referring to nastic movements. Uh, sometimes what your body does, it does by itself without, you know, a decision or a conscious choice. And in the particular case of a hydra, the release 
of its nematocysts are like that. Uh, again, like sponges, um, they can re reproduce asexually by budding, and they can also produce gametes, which they would release into the water. Um, hydra are just absolutely freaky. Um, it's funny, we had Medusa, now we had Hydra. We have a lot of mythological names um, in these. So now we've got sea anemone. Uh, these are part of phylum Nadaria. These um, also have nematocysts. They are triggered by a chemical recognition system. So they have to, you know, identify the thing that they are stinging. Uh, funny enough, funny enough, I'm talking about clownfish. Clownfish don't trigger this defense. They have um, some adaptation that permits um, them to go into, uh, or I should say, between the polyps of a sea anemone and not trigger its nematocyst release. So that makes a great symbiotic relationship. Um, also corals. Corals is a, another group of invertebrates. Uh, these are tiny polyps that live in self-made stone-like structures. Uh, these structures are called reefs. They're huge and they're uh, very hard. They're made of minerals. Um, the structure is flexible enough to open and close while the coral is alive, but obviously when the coral dies, it kind of hardens and becomes rock-like. Um, it's also able to open for feeding and, you know, when it needs to defend itself, it can close. So those are corals. So I mentioned a reef a moment ago. Let's talk about that in a little bit more depth. So corals live in huge colonies. And the way that it works is, so you got like, you know, a layer of corals. Uh, when that generation dies, the new ones just kind of like build up on top of it. And you have a new layer. So new generations of coral build new cup-like structures on top of their predecessors. So this superstructure that results is called a reef. And it's actually an important part of a marine ecosystem. It actually kind of transforms the landscape, so to speak, underwater, and it becomes, um, like uh, like I said, an important part of the marine ecosystem. All right, so uh, let's tie this up with jellyfish because they have an interesting life cycle. So during the Medusa stage, remember that's where they have the bell-shaped body and the tentacles, they are male or female then. So the male will release sperm into the water, that is the male gamete, and some of that sperm will end up um, fertilizing eggs in the female. So if you remember, um, again, from previous sections, when an egg becomes fertilized, it's called a zygote. We talked about that when we were talking about seeds. It will cling to the female's tentacles and it will develop into what is called a planula. Uh, sounds like a, a vampire who likes to make plans, but Moving on. So this planula will swim away and it will attach to a base, grow tentacles and a mouth, and that forms a polyp. So this is almost like a larval jellyfish, okay? Um, a jellyfish zygote that's attached to its mother's tentacles will develop into something that swims away, plants, so to speak, onto some surface forms a polyp. This polyp forms a stack of rings, rings, and each ring forms its own medusa. Fascinating life cycle for a jellyfish. Uh, anyway, so we got through phylum uh, periphera and phylum nidaria. Those are both invertebrates, both marine invertebrates, and it's worth noting that we're talking about the most basic kinds of animals. These animals are all multicellular. They are all heterotrophic consumers. They all have these body shapes and these specialized parts that do all these functions. But compared to everything that we see on a daily basis, these are so simple in their body structures. And yet compared to, say, bacteria, they're so complex. They're, it's a nice complexity compromise in terms of all of life. And it's also worth noting that they're all marine. They all live in the ocean because that is where life started. The most basic forms of animal life found their ecological niche in the ocean and they've been inhabiting it ever since. 
turns out that comb jellyfish and sponges were among the first animals to evolve. And apparently, um, keeping it simple is a good recipe for survival because they've been doing it for millions and millions of years. Anyway, that is uh, invertebrates for now, and I will uh, have another lesson for you at another time. All right.